those who would like to greet each one in Jesus' name this morning. Uh, good to be in the house of the Lord. The, uh, the words were, um, right now I go blank on who said it, but the idea of uh, the Lord is seeking those who would worship him in spirit and in truth. We are in demand as we seek his face. I was, uh, I enjoyed Friday evening. Uh, I would give my thanks also to those that were responsible of leading out and preparing and, and uh, uh, planning, organizing it. Uh, and part of that was probably maybe a little bit of a personal connection. Uh, the family that Daryl Chupps had invited was a, a classmate of mine. And uh, I don't know how long it was since I've seen him last. But uh, in my in my evenings, uh, I was serving his table, and I think I was out there at his table about the third time until he finally turned around and looked me straight in the eyes, and I recognized him by name. So that was interesting. Had a good talk with him. That brought that brought uh, some memories back, and and uh, yesterday. Uh, had some time, uh, not not too busy, just kind of waiting. Uh, you know, uh, I have oil burners, and I have learned by mistake that you don't multitask when you do that. And so you just you just stand there and you just wait because if you start doing something else, you come back and it's overflowing or something. Uh, just standing there, I was listening, and I I researched, and uh, as some of you know, Philip Rudolph was our teacher during that time. I was kind of curious, what happened with Philip Rudolph? And I, I searched and I, I found a website that had a list of, of messages that he had preached. And I listened. And I was blessed. I don't know what all has transpired. I know I know there's difference of opinions in uh, the relationship that some of us students had with Philip Rudolph. But for me, I told Dean Friday evening that uh, I was called to the office twice by Philip Rudolph, and both times I expected to be disciplined. And he talked to me like a father instead. So I have a different opinion of Philip Rudolph than a lot of our students, that my co-students do. Probably because of my upbringing. I don't know if Philip Rudolph has seen through that or not. But looking back in the past, I think I would have deserved more than just a talking to. Because I had knowledge that wasn't being applied. This morning, as I think of a message, oh, I started focusing on time. This was the beginning of last week and the essence of time and how I invest it and the, the guidelines that I use. And finally, I felt like that was the direction. And yet, as the week went on, I wasn't sure. But yet, as I listened to that message that Philip shared, I was blessed, and it, it uh, re-inspired me to, to follow through on that, 
on that message of, of time. And uh, I have a little bit of an illustration here that I would like to, to set up to, to help clarify what I'm after. I think we're all familiar with what, what that represents and how they work. But uh, as we think of time, if I tell you that this is Sunday, February the 25th, and it's 20, no, 17 after 11, I have pinpointed where we're at in existence. We say Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday. Sometimes we get confused and we say the wrong day. But those all terms of just pinpointing time, to some, some extent, they're irreverent. To prove my point, in uh, two weeks, I think, March the 10th, they're going to shift the schedule an hour. What difference does it make? If you go back uh, to 1582, I believe, you'll discover that the way they were calculating time had been misrepresented, and they all of a sudden came to the conclusion that they were 10 days off. And if you were keeping a diary, you would have been filling out your diary to October 4th, and the next day you would have filled out would have been October 15th. 10 days that just disappeared. Nothing to write in your diary, because they decided to change it. So, as we look at time, what I would like to have this, this show us and to, to keep in mind is this only lasts for a certain length of time, but I would like to class that as your lifetime. Now, I know that not all of us have the same length of time, so I should have probably had three, four different sizes of these and different times that they would run out, but uh, we only have one, and I would like to class this as your time, uh, I think we've heard before, the, the, the little dash on, on the gravestone, born, and then a dash, and then death at certain date. Uh, this is that dash, that little space of time that we have, of existence for each one of us as individuals. It doesn't matter where do you say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It might be different for either one of us on when it starts and when it runs out. It doesn't matter. Each one of us is given a slot of time, a block of time. And I would like to look at that as, uh, as an as a, uh, investment opportunity, maybe a commodity that we can use, money. But it's time that we can use. And in that money or time, that commodity that we have in our hands as, as from start to, to finish here, in our life, we use that to buy, to trade, to invest in things that we have to save, that go on to glory as treasures that are laid up, or uh, a loss, or maybe it's an investment that we can reuse and reinvest to gain more. As we think of this being our, our lifespan, uh, that, that gift of life varies in value to us personally by what we perceive as the amount that we have. You know on the market, if the market gets flooded with a certain product, the price drops. We do the same thing, but we don't know we don't know how much time we have, but young people a lot of times feel like life is a long time till I'm 70. And they think they have a lot of time, but we don't know how much time you have. If someone were given uh, a medical uh, diagnosis, I don't know, is Heather here? No. I'm told she was in the hospital Friday evening, and I don't think she was given a death sentence. But if she were given 
One year of time. Expectations of one year yet for life. That year would probably become of more valuable time to her than what it had from here up to this point, even though that's more. And I say that to bring out the idea of our, our earthly projection of time. Do we really stop and consider the frailty of life? I read in the paper of a man that was in perfect health as far as he knew. Uh, he went to town, and one of his daughters wanted to go with him, and he said no, and, and left without her and never returned because he had an aneurysm. What was he thought was in perfect health, never returned. In a moment's time, that aneurysm burst, and there was only seconds of life. We don't know. Maybe I have one. Maybe I have one for me. Maybe you have one. We don't know. But it makes a difference on how I look and value life and how I'm going to invest and trade and what I'm going to try to do with what I have left in the upper part. Let's look at Matthew 25, Matthew 25, verses 14 through 19. This is the parable where Jesus is saying about the, the um, um, talents that were handed out. And I'm going to read it in the NIV because of the, uh, the term that they use. Instead of talents, they use bags of gold. And it's a little more in the, in the uh, what I would like to project this morning in our investments that we can make. Matthew 25, verse 14 through 19. And again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. And then he went on his tr journey. The man ha that re who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one that had two bags of gold gained two more. But the man, the man who had received one bag went dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. And after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. You know the story. You know the outcome. Uh, perspective of what we have in time and our accountability before God. We are going to give account. doesn't matter what length of time we are given, the amount of sand that's in our hourglass, but we are accountable to whatever amount is there, and we're going to give an account. Each man is given the same 24 hours in our way of, of uh, keeping track of time. Each man is given 24 hours a day. Sometimes we think if it would just be a little longer, we could get more done. But I think that's an illusion in our own mind. The power of choice. If we, if we were to switch our time what we call time, tomorrow. As you think of investing tomorrow, if we were to turn that into gold or into money, uh, and you start to put your time to an hourly rate like you do as an employer, when someone comes to work for us or we go to work for someone else, we ask, what will you pay per hour? You put a dollar figure to what your time is worth. And as you put that dollar amount to an hour's time, and then you start to look at how you have invested in the past and what you're planning on tomorrow and how you're going to invest. How much time are you going to give to certain things? And if you calculate what you make per hour, what you want to make per hour, and you take the amount of time that you're going to invest into it, are you getting back what it's worth, the investment that you're making, the, the time you're giving for that product? We look at uh, Proverbs uh, 31. I think we're familiar with that. You don't need to turn to it unless you want to, but I'm just going to read a little bit across that, uh, referring to a virtuous woman. Uh, Proverbs 31, 13 to 21. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ship. She bringeth her food from afar. She writheth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maiden. She considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. She regardeth her loins, she girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arm. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hand to the spindle and her hand to the distaff. She stretches out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hand to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household. 
for all her household are clothed in scarlet. Look at some of the terms that are used in that scripture. Just picking some of the words. She seeketh. She's looking. She knows what she wants. She has some kind of criteria that she's already made up her mind of what she's after, and she's seeking for that. She's working willingly with her hands. If, if that's what it takes, she's committed to it. She knows what she's seeking. She's willing to do what it takes to get that. It says, she bringeth it afar. I'm not sure if that's taken out of context, if, if that okays your shopping trips to distant towns or not but I think maybe it does. Our, our women, our, our sisters do well in, in, in that, that realm. I seen, a, I seen a status the other day that said, shopping wears you out or something like that, and I could agree with that. My wife enjoys that. It's a, it's a pastime, I think. But the virtuous woman, she bringeth it from afar. She rises while it is yet night, Sacrificial, uh, sacrificial commitment of knowing what she's looking for. She's willing to sacrifice sleep. While others are sleeping and resting, she's up, she's busy, she's looking, she's going. She's, she knows what she's after. She giveth meat to her household. Considereth, again, she knows what she's looking for. She's found it. She's looking and deciding, is that is that worth the investment? Is that worth what they're asking for? She planteth a vineyard. That's an investment made, but the returns aren't right away. Someone that has vision, making an investment, preparing for something that's going to have a, a harvest that's later on going to meet a need. She perceiveth her merchandise is good. She stretches out her hand to the poor. She's not selfish. She's ministering to other people, to other needs that she sees as she goes along the way. She stretcheth forth her hand to the needy. She's not afraid. She's confident because she knows what she's after, and who she is, I think. I can we, think we can put that in that context. As we think of the investments that we make in time, how much forethought do you put into it? Easy come, easy go. We have lots of time. I'm young. I want to live it up. Or am I beyond that to where I recognize that time is short, it's fleeting. You think of the, uh, where it says time is like the shuttle of the weaver, back and forth. It's short, it's quick, not a lot of extra. We need to take time to make sure that our, our, uh, our investments are right and that we are on the right track of what we're after. Each deal is final. As we invest that lot of time that we're giving, that amount of sand, as we as we uh, trade that off, the deals are final. If it's a loss cause, we suffer loss. If it's a good cause, maybe there's immediate um, capital gain, or maybe it's like the vineyard. We make, maybe we make an investment that will have a future uh, return. We could, we could start to go down the list of things that there are to do and, and to evaluate the value there and, and, and try to, to, to see how much time we should spend on that. But I'd just like to focus on a, little, on a couple of them just to stir our minds. Um, each deal is final, but no deal is neutral. Each investment we make, we will give an account for, whether it's good or whether it's bad. We will give an account for. Now, some of the things that we invest time in, as I thought of, of, of value, uh, I think of child training and the time that it takes to, to raise a child. Uh, that is a substantial commitment. But we would all readily agree that the blessing is there. And when it is done 
in God's standards, there is a reaping there. The Bible says, blessed is the man that has had his quiver full. I think that is during the time and also after, as they go on their own. I think that's like planting a vineyard. We commit time and effort and finances into lives, and those will, again, rise up and repeat. And being a blessing, uh, as, as you as young people lay hold of truth, blessed is the man. Hmm, just left me. Blessed is the man. Hmm. It's good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. Thank you. Uh, as you apply that a wisdom to what you know and what you can do, it is an honor to you, but it's also something that gives you an experience that, again, is an investment that returns and gives you confidence for the next one. As we, uh, as we think of, of child training, education enters into that. And, uh, you know, education can start as a young child still in our hands all the way up to, what, 20, some to 24, some to 25, some beyond. Depends on how, how much that they put in. But if, if we have that education, the education that we have needs to be applied. Oh, I, I had to think of oh, education. Let, let's say we, we can't read. We can't read. The, there are certain things that we can't do, and I, I don't think there's anybody among us except for young children that haven't gone to school yet that can't read, that, that don't have that ability. But even then, uh, our children don't have to be old enough to read till, until, until they know what that red octagon sign means. They don't know what the STOP stands for, but they know that that sign means stop. And if they're reading something in a book and just the symbol of a stop sign is there, they know what it means. Now, as we think of being educated, having knowledge in life, making investments, occupation, there are signs, there are signs that we can read that we know, some of them without experience, without knowledge. There are certain signs that we can see in life that give us direction. But if a person can read, read and sees the word stop, let's say you're reading directions. Sometimes in the warnings, down at the warnings, it says stop. Depending on what they're trying to do, they'll have a word stop there and the stop sign to get your attention to make sure that you don't do the wrong thing with the product that they're describing on how to use. If you can read and you don't listen to what you have seen and understood, the knowledge that you have of the word stop, that is the same way as those things that we see in life, those things that we have been handed down through uh, and we are blessed, uh, as Tim mentioned, the many Bibles that we have. And we have been raised in godly homes, most of us, I think. Uh, we, are, we are blessed. The lines have fallen to us in pleasant places, a goodly heritage. But if we have that knowledge and we don't use it, we don't yield to it, what good is it? And as we start to acquire the the uh, opportunity to make our choices as young people, and we have that knowledge and we don't use it, it is the same way as being able to read and not take care or not, not respond when we see the stop sign. We just go straight through. Those things will cost our life physically. If you read the directions and you don't follow in them, there's a good chance it'll take your life. The spiritual sense is the same way as we have that knowledge and we don't use it. It can cost our spiritual life. Sometimes we say the little things. Well, it's just a little bit of time. It's just, just one evening or everybody else is doing it. We use those justifications for an investment that we want to make. But the end result of giving that little bit, the little foxes spoil the vine. It's the little things that add up and cause us to cause us grief.
We think of the choice of labor, our daytime jobs. Are they neutral? The investment that we're making, the time that we're giving in exchange for our daytime jobs. I think we would be quick to say, no, they're not neutral. And we need to choose wisely in what we're doing and what, what, we're, what we're giving our talents to and producing. Um, but in that as well, we're, we're um, getting a wage, and we can take that wage and reinvest it again. So um, we can't divide. We can't divide this sand in, in church life and home life uh, and social life. Uh, we can't divide that sand. In the same way, our investments, if we try to say that our occupation is one thing, I, just, I have to leave the family, I'm going to have to go to work, that is to a certain extent the truth. But as we work, we are still called to serve in the kingdom. We may not be with the family, but we're making ends meet for the family, making, me, meeting the needs of our family. And as we have time, uh, depending on what your occupation is, you can do that with your family. But it is all in one thing. We can't separate it. They need to be intertwined. You cannot make enough money in your occupation, whatever you do during the week, as men or women. We can't make enough financially to where we can use it to reinvest and gain what we have lost if we separate that time from our family. You cannot take the wages you earn in being separated with your family if it's too long or too extensive. You cannot take the extra money that you have made and go on a vacation and regain the loss that you have experienced by that investment of time. We need to be careful with those investments of labor where it is, and how much time. We think of a game. What value is a game? As a family, we play games, or as youth groups. Sometimes we get together as small groups, and we have time where we play games. The game in itself is nothing, but it is a socialization. And it's an investment, and it's an inspiration, giving wisdom, sharing, spending time with, giving worth. As I think of games, I, I the thought of puzzles came to my mind, and I, I struggle with that thing sometimes. I, I think that maybe a little far-fetched, but why would you take a perfectly fine piece of art and cut it into pieces, mix it all up, throw it in a box, and sell it to someone to put it back together? Just sell them the piece of art. But there is some value, and, and uh, we have in the recent past uh, enjoyed putting puzzles together. Uh, I'm not one that likes the hard ones. I like, I like something, uh, not, not a child's one, but I like something that I can at least make some progress on in the evening. Two, three pieces doesn't cut it for me. But again, there's socialization. There's brain power. There's things that we are investing that we can use in the kingdom of God as we do those simple things like that. No investment is neutral. Sports. I know we shy away from playing ball especially organized sports. We shy away from that. But there's kids' clubs. There's the ball games we play out here as a church. And they have value. But what is the thought behind it? Why am I involved in it, or why am I not involved in them? They're not neutral. Those decisions are not neutral. And if I do those things with an investment for the kingdom of God's sake, and I'm not saying that and advocating that we get involved in in the NBA or those kinds of sports that are organized. Uh, but I think that God has used some people in those situations for his kingdom's sake. Uh, I don't know, I didn't look at it, but I'm told that there was tremendous amount of investment made just recently in the Super Bowl by two different organizations to present God in a godly society. Uh, I assume it was there. I just seen an article of it, but I didn't see it in, in the actual news advertisements. But uh, yeah. During, during the most popular time of the Super Bowl, there were two different Christian places that presented a uh, commercial on behalf of God's kingdom. Places we wouldn't normally be or go, but God is working there as well to draw men to himself in his own way. How about vacation? We all enjoy them. But what is it? What is it that causes me to go vacation? Is it, is it time spent with family? Is it time spent alone? Is it something that has self-gratification that drives me to that? 
those, those things need to be answered because we're going to give an account for them. They're a tr- trading off of some of life, of the, the block of value that we have been given. Uh, screen time. That's a touchy subject. If you remember again, if you take that hourly rate that you're giving yourself and you start to keep track of how much time, I don't know if you have that on your phones or not, but my phone will, every Sunday morning, it tells me what my average screen time was for the past week. Sometimes I'm glad it didn't pop up here because of the amount of time. But we're giving it an account for that time that's spent. And if I think of the hourly rate that I would give myself, and what that tells me, how much time I was on that screen on a daily basis, and I take that hourly rate times that amount of time, did I receive enough from that time of looking at the screen that I should continue? Or do I need to make changes? It's hard to control, I recognize. But just challenging us to take a, take a look at those things. One of the biggest mistakes we make with time is to think that we have a lot of it or that we have extra, we have enough. Uh, yeah, I can say that from experience. I think I, I'm running a little early. I have plenty of time, and the next thing I know, I'm late. We all have a lot of opportunities here in America. As you think of, of your schedule, how many of us could say we have never felt like we have more than what we can do tomorrow? Somewhat discouraged to think about what's coming tomorrow because it's more than what we can do. We are blessed in America, but I would challenge us as we think of tomorrow, if that is how your tomorrow looks, it's because we're blessed and we have many opportunities, but in those opportunities, we need to, as the virtuous woman, to stop and consider. There's good and there's better and best, and we dare not rest with just the best if we can get the best. If you follow me through that thing, those choices that we're making are those things that are, that are filling my schedule to overwhelming. Are they all of such quality? Or can I prioritize them and say, I'm going to start at the most valuable part and work my way through, and if I can't do them all, this is what drops. What criteria am I using to set the test of what I prioritize and how I prioritize? There's temporal, and there's eternal. There's a gratification for now, and there's those investments that we make that will return in the future, possibly reinvest or reap for them. Someone has said, time is free, but it is priceless. You can own it. You cannot own it, but you can spend it. You can use it, but you can't keep it. Once it's gone, you can't get it back. A lot of truth there. Now, just, just to stir your thoughts a little bit on time and the amount of time that you're given in life. The average, I just Googled some of these things. The average male in America today lives to the age of 77. Now, I think we've got some that are beyond that already. But the average age is 77. If you get a good night's sleep each night, which is recommended, there goes a third of your life. You just lost, or no, you just invested 24 years. You say, oh, I can do less, I can do it with less than that. When I was young, I, I did too. But there's also uh, knowledge out there that if you go 17 hours, now the recommended amount of sleep is seven and a half to eight hours of sleep in a 24 hour period. They say if you go 17 hours without sleep, that is just infringing a little bit into the recommended amount of sleep. They say the average human being going 17 hours without sleep is similar 
his brain function at the end of the 17 will be about like 0 0.05 alcoholic level in his blood count. Half drunk. I don't feel that way at 17 hours, I don't think. But yet there is that psychological, physical thing that comes into our body that when we press beyond that limit that we are going to um, we're going to be giving less value in the investments that we're making because of that sacrifice. You take that into um, going one hour, uh, one, one day without sleep. How many of you, have, I won't raise, ask for a raise of hand, but how many of us have done an all-nighter, we say? We just go without sleep. We have so much to do, we just keep going. And as long as we don't hold still, we're fine. When we hold still, we drop. Statistics say... If you go 24 hours without sleep, you are same as point, no, yeah, point one zero blood alcohol level, and that is legally drunk. I think in, I think in Indiana it's point zero eight if I have it right. So your 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 mind function is being lowered to where you cannot consider as sharply and as quickly as you would if you had stopped to take sleep and been more effective in what you have done. Years ago, I asked my father-in-law if, uh, if it's okay that we would do 40 hours in four days rather than in five days. He was quiet for a little bit. I don't see him on there. Either. He was quiet for a little bit, and he said, I would rather have eight to eight and a half hours of quality time per day in five days. He had some value that I didn't see as a young man. I thought I could pull the 10-day 10 day, 10 day workday off and gain one day at home. But there is some truth to that. Okay, so now you're living to 77. You're sleeping seven and a half to eight hours. There goes um, 24 years of your time. It takes 18 to 21 years of time to grow up. Education, family training, and, and maturing. Oh, so there goes 18 to 21 years. Uh, depending on where you, where you retire, there goes another 12 years that you're slowing down and retiring and not as active. And so now you have about 48 years of prime time, if I may say prime time. And I don't mean that to, to look down on our older men because I think they have something to offer, even though they're not physically active like they used to be. Um, they are an inspiration. So now you have 48 hours, uh, 48 years of life. Of those 48 years, five days, you're going to be working for every week that, that, that you have there. So there goes another 1,782 weeks of work. Now you have two days of vacation weekends. One of those is the Lord's Day. You can't work there. So you have one day that you have left to work and catch up on things that you didn't do during the week because you were on the job. If you add these things all up, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm moving fast enough that you can't probably keep up with me. You can check up on it later. But you don't have a lot of time left for vacation anymore. And the reason I say those things is if you start to separate those times into different categories, and you don't have them intertwined and pulling together toward one common goal, those investments are going to be a loss. When it comes to give an account to. There's a higher calling than the job. There's a higher calling than vacation. There's a higher calling than all these other things that needs to be in perspective as we consider what we're investing our time in. Life is short, so invest in the important on this everyday side of routine. William Shakespeare said some of the same things that I just mentioned a little bit ago, but just a little different different uh, scenario, and I like the way he ends. He said, time is very slow for those who wait. Time is fast for those who are scared. Time is long for those who are sad. Time is short for those who celebrate, but for those who love, time is eternal. I had to think of the scripture that was posted around in different places or referred to Friday evening, and that's 1 Corinthians 13, 13, where it says, and now that these three remain, faith, hope, and 
charity, but the greatest of these is love or charity. Faith is only faith until it's fulfilled, until we come to sight, and that ends, faith. The faith that we have in God is going to end when eternity begins. Hope is only hope until it is realized, and then it ends. And I think that ends when eternity starts, as far as our Christian walk of life. But love, the greatest one of these, is eternal. It continues on. Never ends. As I think of that investment of love being eternal, I think of an investment that is made that there's maybe not a return right now, but there will be a harvest beyond a hundredfold as we make those investments with the time that's given us, that a lot of time, whatever length it is, whatever age we are, when we pass from here on, that return of love in eternity will, beyond, will be beyond a hundredfold. We cannot comprehend the things that God has in store for them that love him. That's what the Bible says. Martin Luther Jr. said, Time itself is neutral. The bad seems to to make more gain than the positive because of lack of perseverance. And I think of that as something that we have to to keep working on. Be not weary in well-doing, in those things that you are occupied in, that are positive, that you know and have considered and know that are a good investment. Be not weary in well-doing, but continue on, because to sit in the boat and not to row is to go the wrong direction. We know that principle. We need to keep pushing in child training, line upon line, precept upon precept. Sometimes I, in my position, I see young parents and I, I tell them, don't worry. It's just a phase they're going through. It'll be different. So we think of, of the spiritual side, perseverance. We can't, on the physical side of life, we don't go to the gym just one time a day and expect to have a a real positive result in our physical appearance as far as muscle building. That is every day or every other day. It needs to be continual, uh, a part of that workout. And the same on the side of of spiritual. uh, We can't just expect to, to have the Saturday night crunch preparation for Sunday morning and to be on top of it. It has to be intertwined in the whole, a common goal in the whole being of what our investments are. Our pursuit is higher than just buying a field, but it's a greater vision than that in what we're going to do for the kingdom's sake with that which we have purchased. Daniel was known for praying three times a day in a dedicated place. Tim just sent me a photo from Bangladesh. And in the picture or the video, you can hear the call for prayer. We don't have that in America. Uh, But how many times do we stop and pray? Are we known to be a man of prayer? I think I laugh. You know, we pray all the time. Pray without ceasing, the Bible says. But do we have dedicated times that we are meeting with God? Investing in the most important part of life that we can. That connection to the eternal. Giving us a vision that will surpass the struggles that we face. The waves that that cause Peter to lose his footing. We face those same things but are we making a connection to look beyond that and see Jesus? Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Touched a little bit about that on, in our Sunday school lesson in the men's class. We have so many blessings, and Satan has not uh, 
relinquished or stopped trying to um, cause us to stumble and, and uh, yield to temptation after he had Adam and Eve. But I think he has enhanced his ability and he has more advantage on us today because of the, 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 uh, the blessings that we have here in America. As we consider the investments that you have made in the past, are those investments portraying to the world around you that there is a God, that there is a peace that passeth all understanding? We fear, and this, this thought comes from the message that I was listening that Philip Rudolph preached. Uh, he referred to some book that someone had written about some, some prophecies that they were making. And the one person prophesied about something that was taking place. And with that, they were, as a nation, concerned back then. It was in uh, uh, 20, uh, 1980. Uh, concerned about what other nations may do to America and the pain and... Um, oppression that might follow uh, those situations. Another person had written a prophecy or projection, and he's, in his, he had made the projection that it was not the pain or oppression that another nation would do, but it was the internal blessings that America has. Our... our uh, I want to say frugality, that's not the word, but our prosperity that we have is what is going to do the damage to God's kingdom. And I'm afraid too many times that's the truth. As we consider the opportunities that we have today with the finances and things that God has given us as his people in America, what are we doing with them? Does it okay it just because I have the finances to do it? Just because my job can bear, does that okay it? Is my investment blurring the lines for those that follow me? As people look at my lifestyle, do they see the virtuous woman, the virtuous man that Solomon referred to? How do I display the results that God has made in my life? You know, if the conscience says that I need to change, then that's what it takes. If we see the writing, if we see the writing on the wall, if our conscience is telling us something and we don't respond, it's the same as seeing the stop sign and saying, it's different for me, and not applying the knowledge that we have and making a choice that will be a loss when we come to the eternal. In the scripture that Tim shared in the opening, it caught my attention because, you know, I don't really have the answers. And if you come to me and would ask, what should I do in this situation? Sometimes we just say, well, we need to pray about it. And sometimes there's silence. We don't know. What is right? What should we do? How do we move forward? The verse that Tim shared. Call upon him. Jeremiah 33, 3. He will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. He is there. He is pursuing us. He has a desire for those that worship him in spirit and in truth. It's not something that he has begun and now it's up to us to finish. But he's going to finish that work of righteousness in each one of our hearts until the day of Jesus Christ, the Bible says. The truth will set you free. I challenge you that you consider what criteria you're using for the judgments and the investments that you're making and to allow truth to speak to your heart and find peace in those things. 
In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, we come to you this morning and desire that your kingdom would be fulfilled here among us on earth as it is in heaven. That we would have the wisdom to know, and to follow through, the insight and understanding that is needed. That your kingdom would flourish within each of our hearts personally, but also in our midst as a congregation. And allow that light to shine as a city that is set on a hill, that you would be glorified. And that you would draw men to yourself through Jesus Christ. We thank you for the inspiration of your word and the many blessings that we have here. May you grant us the wisdom to be frugal and to be stewards of your blessings in a way that brings honor and glory to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Thanksgiving. Amen.